We're going to continue along with the Mycenaeans, and in the next video we will get to the Greek Dark Ages. And so in the last video we talked about the Mycenaeans, and we're going to expand upon some of the points that I made in the last video. Now this is a model of Mycenae, and you will remember that Mycenae is the main stronghold in the Mycenaean Empire. And so we're going to break down some of the main areas within this stronghold. Now, of course, here is the Lion Gate right here. And then after you entered that, you would come across the Grave Shaft A. And we will talk about that in a few slides, but that's right here. And just past that are these residential homes that were built. And it is important to note that this originally was not within the walls. Later on, the walls were extended to include these two areas. Now, right here housed the garrison and guard quarters. And then on top of this hill up here is the main palace. And in classical Greek times, this would have been called the Acropolis. Now this path right here leads to some more buildings that were behind the palace, as well as a cistern which held water, and also another gate. Now of course this is very different from Knossos, which we talked about in the Minoan lecture. You will remember that there was no main wall surrounding Knossos, but here around Mycenae is a major wall. So it's clear that the Mycenaeans were thinking about defense when they built their strongholds. And so it's led to a lot of speculation as to what those threats might have been. Was it a threat from land? Was it a threat from sea? Obviously we can't be exactly sure what that threat was, but it's clear that the Mycenaeans were a very warlike civilization. And so let's break down some of the main areas in this stronghold. So let's first take a look at the Lion Gate, and this is the most heavily fortified area at Mycenae. And of course this gate is famous for the depiction of the two lions above the main entrance. And actually that may be a depiction of a lioness, or a pair of them, above the gate. And you can see that the heads are missing as well. And since this was the most heavily fortified area, it is thought that most Bronze Age attacks against a stronghold occurred at the gate. So there really wasn't the type of siege warfare going on that we will see later on in antiquity. And there you can see on the bottom right a lion carved out of ivory. And also there were lion bones discovered at Mycenae. And in addition there have also been some carvings that have been discovered that depict lion hunts. And so that has led to some speculation that lions existed in Greece during this period. And perhaps they were hunted to extinction by the Mycenaeans in Greece. Now let's talk about the Grave Circle A. And as I said, that is right past the Lion Gate. And this was uncovered by Heinrich Schliemann. And we will talk about him in the next video. And he was a German archaeologist who wanted to find evidence that the Trojan War was a real historical event. And so he went all across the Mediterranean looking for evidence. And one of the places he ended up at was Mycenae. And one of the first areas he uncovered was this Grave Circle A. And this was one of the most important finds in Bronze Age Greece. And what he found was several burial shafts that contained several men or warriors, and some of these men had golden funeral masks over their faces. But there were numerous other items found down in these shafts. Items such as signet rings, uh, breastplates, dozens of swords and daggers. And so we really do get a very good idea of the weapons that the Mycenaeans were using during their time period. Now, as I said, Schliemann wanted to tie this to the Trojan War and prove that it was the Mycenaeans who attacked Troy. And one mask that was found was quite exquisite. And Schliemann was convinced that he had found the mask of Agamemnon. Now, it has since been pretty much proved that this was not the mask of Agamemnon, because these have been dated almost to the start date of the Mycenaean civilization itself. And so these might have been the first rulers of the Mycenaean civilization. And they have been dated to around 1600 BC. And so again, that dates to a time period far earlier than when the Trojan War was thought to have taken place. And the reality is no one knows the names of who these rulers were. They are unnamed. But we can make a good assertion that these probably were the first kings of the Mycenaean civilization. And it's quite obvious from the quantities of gold that were discovered in these grave shafts that these were very, very wealthy kings. And these artifacts indicate their honor and status in Mycenaean society. Now, if you take a look at that picture above the mask of Agamemnon, that is the breastplate that one of the kings was wearing. And so you can see the amount of effort that went into this artifact. 
Now let's take a look at the grave shaft over here. You can see this on the left. And if you take a look, these grave shafts were rectangular or square. And you can see one right here in this picture. And so Schliemann would have been digging down into these, finding all of these artifacts. Now on the right here, you'll see this slab that was discovered at Grave Circle A. And these are kind of similar to the concept of a gravestone. And you will see on here that there is this depiction of a chariot. So we know the Mycenaeans had chariots and that they were using them in the numerous wars that they would have fought. Now let's take a look at the palace of Mycenae. And this type of palace is called a Megaron. That's the name ascribed to it by archaeologists. And it usually comes in three distinct parts. And its entrance is usually this two-columned porch. And then the second part is sort of this waiting room. And you can see that here in this photo as well. And then there's the main hall, which was supported by four columns. And this would have been where the king would have been situated. And as I said, again, this was a three-part structure. And the layout of the Megaron, this type of palace, is believed to go as far back as 7000 BC. And there's some evidence that it originated from modern day Russia. And so this type of palace was located all throughout the Mycenaean Empire. There are several other strongholds that have this same type of palace. And this also would be the same format, same blueprint, if you will, that was used by the ancient Greeks for their temples. And we'll talk about that in future videos. So with that, let's take a look at a reconstruction of the palace. And there you can see in front, there's the two-column porch. And here, of course, is the main hall. And you can see that fireplace right in the middle there and the four columns that support the roof. The insides of this palace would have been very colorful. And all the walls and columns would have been painted. Uh, and there would have been numerous paintings throughout the palace. Now, as you saw in the last slide, there's not a lot left of these Mycenaean palaces. We really only have the uh, bottom part of the structure that's left. So we really don't know exactly how the the roof was constructed but it is thought that some of these roofs would have been flat and would have been constructed out of wood and supporting beams and the rooftop also would have been tiled with ceramic and um, some sort of terracotta tile now the palace might have been used for all sorts of activities there might have been some religious festivals going on here and also, certainly, the king would have received uh, foreign dignitaries. And also, there would have been storage areas below the palace. So you would have had storerooms for goods such as wine, uh, barley, oil, those type of items. Now, the forces at Mycenae had access to water. And what they did was they built a tunnel to a underground source of water. And as I said, that was within the stronghold. And so that was very important because if you were under siege, you would not be cut off from your supply of water. Now, you might be able to go several weeks, even months without food. But if you lose your supply of water, that might force a surrender within just a matter of days. And you can see in these two photos right here, the entrance that leads down to the source of water and also leads away from from it. Now, one of the things discovered at Mycenae are these bronze scales, and actually these have been discovered across the Mediterranean. So it is believed they were used widely throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. But the most remarkable discovery occurred at a place called Dendra, and a complete set of this heavy armor was discovered there, and it has been dated to around 1500 BC. So it is clear that the Mycenaeans were using heavy armor, long before the heavy armor that the hoplites would have used in classical Greece. And so this scale armor is one of the oldest forms of metal body armor found. And this Dendra Panoply, as it has been called, consists of 15 separate bronze pieces, and they are held together by leather strips. And it would have covered the warrior from his neck all the way to his knees. Now, it's not exactly known what this armor was used for. But it has been speculated that it was probably too heavy for a foot soldier to use. So it has been speculated by ancient historians that a charioteer would have used this and he probably would have wielded a long weapon like a long spear or something like that. And again, the armor was probably too heavy for a foot soldier. It just would not have been flexible enough to move around in a meaningful manner. Now also, a helmet has been discovered and it's made up of these boar tusks. And you can see that right here in this picture. Now, it probably wasn't too easy easy to go around killing boars, so it probably took quite a bit of effort to uh, make these helmets. 
Now, historians have noted that this kind of links up with some of the descriptions of Homer. And you can see that passage right here on the left. And you can see Homer is talking about wild boar's white teeth making up the helmet. Now, he calls them teeth, but it sort of links up with some of the Bronze Age archaeological finds. So that's sort of tantalizing to think about. So we talked about in the last couple of lectures the spread of Mycenaean and Minoan pottery throughout the eastern Mediterranean. So we see that pottery in places like Egypt and Mesopotamia. And so that is a constant theme that we start to see developing in the Bronze Age, an increasing reliance on trade. And what did this vital trade rely on? Ships. And so shipping became very important to the Mycenaeans. And it wasn't just supplies. They were important for communication and even for war. And there have been a couple of very important finds relating to ship design and the cargo that they carried. And one of those Bronze Age shipwrecks occurred at a place called Ulu Barun. And as I said, this was a Bronze Aged cargo ship. And it sank around the late 14th century BC. And as you can see on this map, it was trying to navigate around this cape and it never made it. It went down and probably all of the sailors died as well. But it gave archaeologists and historians an invaluable look at ship designs in the Bronze Age as well as the cargo. And we'll get to that in the next slide. Now they were able to construct a model of this ship based off the wreckage that was found. And you'll notice first that there is only one set of oars. So essentially this ship was propelled more by wind. And so again, this would have been a typical cargo ship. Now you might ask, well, why wouldn't they have multiple oars on this type of ship? And the main reason is, is that if you add more oars, there will be less space for storage. And so the space was primarily used for storage. Now the warships during the Bronze Age had multiple oars, and we'll get to that in a few slides. Now the cargo on this shipwreck at Ulu Barun was very important. It gave us a look at some of the cargo that would have been transported during the Bronze Age. And this was a massive haul in terms of what was discovered. The ship carried tons of copper ingots. It also included bronze tools, uh, glass ingots, gold cups, and you can see some of those items in the picture on the left. Now there has been a lot of discussion about where this ship originated from and where it was heading to and who owned the ship. And it's unclear because the cargo contains pieces from Cyprus, Egypt, and other areas around the eastern Mediterranean. Now there is some evidence that there were at least two Mycenaeans aboard. And these might have been envoys or they could have been protecting the expensive cargo that was on the ship. And so some archaeologists have hypothesized that this ship was bound for Mycenaean territory and that this might have been a royal ship. But again, it's unclear because of all the different types of items and what type of items were found on that ship. But again, this is an extremely important find because it gave us a look at not only the construction of Bronze aged cargo ships, it also gave us a look at the cargo that was on board. Okay, let's move on. Now there was another interesting find at a place called Akrotiri, and that was a Minoan Bronze Age settlement that was consumed by a volcanic eruption that occurred around 1600 BC. And so this settlement was buried in volcanic ash, but it preserved some excellent frescoes. And frescoes, of course, are wall paintings. And one of those paintings has been called the Theron Ship Painting. And it gave historians and archaeologists another good picture at what Bronze Aged ships looked like. And you can see on this painting right here, there are eight main ships. And one thing that's interesting to note is that three are masted ships, and then you can see the other five have lowered masts. Now, one thing that archaeologists and ancient historians have to be careful about when they're examining these paintings is that the artist, whoever he or she was, didn't take liberties when they were representing these ships. So they always have to keep that in mind. You will also notice that these have narrow holes, and so that enabled these ships to slice right through the waves, probably providing greater stability. Okay, so let's take a look at the evolution of ships from the Bronze Age right up into classical times. Now the main difference in these ships is how many decks of oars they have. So if you take a look at that ship in the top left, that Bronze Age ship, that has one deck of oars. You can see that very clearly. And that pretty much was the norm right up until about the 8th century BC. But then a new type of ship starts to appear, and that is called the Byreme. And that had two decks of oars. And you can see that right here. One, two, 
one, two, it has two decks of ores. And so that was a technological advance. And then we get to the trireme, and that had three decks of ores. And you can see that in this illustration right here. One, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. And that actually was the default ship during the classical period. And actually the trireme had two sets of its ores on the second deck, and you can see that right here in this illustration, and one set of ores on the first deck, and you can see that right here. And the ships also naturally increased in size as you added more decks of ores. And what do more ores give you? It gives you more speed. What does more speed give you? That gives you more ramming ability. Now there's no evidence that the Bronze Age ships were ramming. Probably more boarding action going on where they simply would board the enemy ship and try to kill the enemy sailors. But after the 8th century BC, ramming became the primary naval tactic. And in order to do that successfully, you needed more ores. And so again, there was less of that going on during the Bronze Age. They probably operated more as fighting platforms. Okay, so let's wrap this video up by talking about the Sea Peoples. And I talked about them in the last lecture as being one of the potential causes for the Bronze Age collapse. And we know about the Sea Peoples through the ancient Egyptians. Now, it is unclear where or even who the Sea Peoples were. Some scholars believe the Sea Peoples may have been a confederation of raiders from Italy and Sicily, but again, it is unknown exactly where they came from. But if the ancient Egyptian chroniclers are to be believed, the Sea Peoples wiped out several civilizations. They took down the Mycenaeans, the Hittites, Israel, and according to the Egyptians, quote, no land could stand before their arms, end quote. And so they were a wrecking ball, and Egypt was their next target. And this all culminated in the Battle of the Delta, which occurred in 1178 BC. And this was one of the last major battles in the Bronze Age. And actually, it's one of the few battles that we have a description about, and it's one of the few battles that we can actually give a name to. And this is actually a relief found in one of the Egyptian temples. And just take a look at that for a second. You get an idea of the absolute savagery of this battle. This was an epic battle, but it is not known how many casualties were suffered on either side. But we can assume that there must have been tens of thousands of casualties suffered. Now, the Egyptians would survive the invasion by the Sea Peoples, but barely. Their treasury was depleted as a result, and even though the Egyptians survived, they were never really the same. Egypt was only a shadow of its former self, and eventually, as we know, we would see the rise of other empires. Empires in Rome, Carthage, and in Greece. And so Egypt would take a back seat to some of these city-states that would develop several centuries later. And so with that, we arrive at the Greek Dark Ages, which occurred roughly between 1100 and 800 BC. And we will get to that in the next video.